First on our list today, we have the discovery and revival of an ancient virus freed from the Antarctic permafrost after 48,500 years. Oh my gosh, have we learned nothing from sci-fi and television. You do not restore ancient viruses. You don't do it. Well, they did it. The zombie virus was discovered as a result of melting ice in the Antarctic region after laying dormant for tens of thousands of years. And honestly, scientists believe that while the risks are low, much like your ex, it does raise red flags as a potential endangerment to human health. The virus was returned to its former infectious glory in the lab after being inserted with cultured cells. Luckily for us, as of yet, scientists have only attempted to reanimate viruses that target single cell amoebas, not humans or animals. That's great and all, but it still seems like pretty risky business to me. The scientist who performed the reanimation maintains he has done so to shed light on the potential risk of more dangerous viruses' ability to resurface and affect humans should the Antarctic permafrost continue to melt. Not only that, but as the ice continues to thaw, it also has the potential to release chemical and radioactive waste into our ecosystems. So, think about that. Next up, we have the discovery of a hidden landmass, frozen in time and ice, and estimated to be bigger than Belgium. The landscape consists of hills and valleys believed to have been carved by ancient rivers over millions of years ago. Its existence was confirmed using a technique called radio echo sounding, which uses sound waves to determine distances based off of which corresponding maps of underground structures and landscapes can be created. Without even laying eyes on an area, we are able to determine the heights of its peaks and the depths of its deepest points. The area of land stretching 32,000 square kilometers, 12,000 square miles, is a scientific marvel as scientists believe its climate and geology to have been massively different from that of modern day Antarctica. Which of course brings me to my next point. Also discovered within the ice and hidden beneath the frozen desert were the remains of an estimated 90 million year old subtropical rainforest. Scientists were so excited when deep beneath the ice they discovered an incredibly well-preserved network of root systems within a sediment core sample. A sediment core sample is basically like a ground extraction that shows all the layers of sediment that have settled over the last, I guess in this case, 90 million years. Not only did they find root systems, but the soil was so well preserved that they were also able to find traces of pollen, spores, and the remains of flowering plants. Based on these findings, it was concluded that the coast of West Antarctica at one point in time contained a thick, swampy rainforest which was home to a large variety of plant and animal species. Scientists also concluded weather patterns of heavy rainfall and heightened levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Next on the list, we have BLOOD Falls. I apologize for having to spell it out for you. I don't think I'm allowed to say that word on here, but just by the look, I'm sure you can guess where the name comes from. So let's talk about the color. If you want to guess how it happens, I'll give you a moment. Maybe pause the video, head to the comments, lock in your answer. You done? Okay, the answer is iron, but not in the way you think. The red waters are rich in iron, but they don't actually turn red until they come into contact with the air. Well, maybe you did think that, but let me explain further. It's actually a mix of iron oxides and hydroxides along with high salt content in the water, chlorine and magnesium that give the river flow its yellow, orange and reddish coloring rather than the classic like murky brown we would usually see coming out of eroded sink faucets. Super creepy, but again, super cool. Next up, we have the discovery of ancient bacteria like nothing we've ever seen on Earth before. Like it's so strange, scientists wonder if it might possibly have come from like outer space. Perhaps a passenger on an ancient asteroid that arrived on Earth millions of years ago. And why do they think that? Well, because generally bacteria has a minimum requirement of six things it needs in order to survive, and those things are food, acidity, time, generally a warm temperature, oxygen, and moisture. But this bacteria just needs air, making it an absolute scientific anomaly and a massive discovery that moves us forward in our understanding of the way in which extraterrestrial organisms might be able to survive on other planets and in space. What do you guys think? 
As we move past our halfway point, let's go beneath the ice all the way down to the Antarctic seafloor where the once lost ship Endurance was discovered in impeccable condition, preserved by the country's icy waters. For a long time, the Endurance shipwreck remained one of the greatest undiscovered mysteries, but that all changed in 2022 when, at a depth of 3,008 meters, the vessel was found. And that's 9,868.8 feet. The discovery was made via a combination of helicopters, underwater robots, and other state-of-the-art technology, which allowed it to be remotely filmed and explored. Although the wreck was crushed by ice and sunk over 100 years ago, the ship's name was Although the wreck was crushed by ice and sunk over 100 years ago, the ship's name was still clearly legible along the stern of the vessel. And this is an incredible scientific feat as it highlights the extreme advances in technology, allowing us to explore some of the most inhospitable and extreme depths of our oceans. And next up we have a freaky looking lanky underwater insect known as the giant sea spider. While they aren't actually spiders, they are in fact part of the insect family and they are the largest sea spider found anywhere in the world with some showing off a leg span of up to 10 inches. Ooh. These animals belong to a rare group that have no need for a respiratory system, breathing instead through their digestive system. The animal typically feeds off anemones, sea worms, jellyfish, sponges, and soft corals, making it technically carnivorous. And it feeds using a small tube which it inserts into its soft bodied prey, allowing it to literally suck their guts out. Gross. As for the spider's guts, those are stored in the long spindly legs of the creature, commonly found in shallow waters surrounding Antarctica. However, they have also been spotted at depths of 7,000 meters, 23,000 feet, making them highly adaptable to changes in both pressure and environment. Next up, we have another relative giant, the giant Antarctic scale worm, which measures in at 20 centimeters, 7.8 inches long, and 10 centimeters, 4 inches wide. Now, that might not seem gigantic to you, but remember, it's a worm, so. Yeah, it's pretty big. And it's also super uncomfortable to look at. Well, from head on, but the underbelly is actually quite cool, looking as though the creature is lined with shiny gold feathers along its edges, which are actually appendages that help it move along rock formations and the sea floor. Its back is covered in scales that act as fully functioning body armor to protect against predators. Back to the head, which is, to put it nicely, unpleasant, and it's not even a head, really, it's just a fully retractable throat. While there is still so much we don't know about this recently discovered creature, the two sharp fangs on both its top and bottom jaw suggest it has a carnivorous diet and hunting rather than scavenging behavior. The animal is known to enjoy depths of up to 1,640 feet, and they're also super good for the underwater ecosystem, assisting in the building of reefs by recycling ocean waste through a process called worm composting where they turn food scraps into other organic material that acts like soil for the sea floor. Next up in our top two today we have Mount Erubus, the world's southernmost fully active volcano that last erupted in 20 20, and contains a very elusive lava lake. The lava lake sits within the volcano and it's basically a pool of molten lava that never hardens but instead remains in a constant viscous fluid state. While you might have assumed this kind of thing to exist at the bottom of every active volcano around the world, you'd be incorrect as they are actually incredibly rare because they require an incredibly specific set of conditions to be able to form. You see, a volcano's lava is generally held way underground in something called a magma chamber that connects to a volcano through an underground channel in the Earth's crust. And ever so often, under the right conditions, the magma chamber sends lava shooting up through the channel and the crater of the volcano into the atmosphere. A lava lake is different. It exists above ground within the crater of a volcano. And the bottom of the lake is connected to the magma chamber by a much shorter passageway called a conduit, which is basically like a long pipe. The lava from the chamber rises into the lake and when the lava begins to cool, it moves back down towards the chamber to heat and rise once more. Thus, the lake remains unfrozen and in constant flow. Also a pretty cool sight to see. And finally, last on the list, we have ancient skulls, or at least that's what they kind of look like. These elongated skulls were allegedly found in 2016 by a team of archaeologists working in Antarctica. 
The discovery was shocking, and the bones dated all the way back to 1820. And it was originally believed that humans had not set foot in Antarctica until hundreds of years later. Of course, the timeline, along with the appearance of the bones, has led many to speculate that these bones are not belonging to the first humans in Antarctica, but rather the first extraterrestrials on Earth. While scientists are still baffled by the age of the bones, the shape of them didn't come as too much of a surprise to professionals, as the elongated skulls have been discovered in other places around the world and have been attributed to ritualistic physical cultural practices done by certain ancient societies. It has been said, however, that these particular skulls appear to not only be elongated, but much bigger than any to have ever been found before. So. Who knows, maybe aliens aren't such a bad guess after all. The Imperial Trans-Antarctic Expedition. So this is actually a case where the crew managed to make it back home, but it was a struggle. The Imperial Trans-Antarctic Expedition, led by Sir Ernest Shackleton, aimed to cross Antarctica from the Weddell Sea to the Ross Sea. In August of 1914, the expedition set sail from England aboard the Endurance, a ship built to withstand the icy Antarctic Arctic waters, but in January of 1915, the ship became trapped in the pack ice of the Weddell Sea, and for months the crew waited, hoping for the ice to finally release its grip, but the Endurance eventually sank. And now the crew is stranded on drifting ice flows where uh, they had to just camp. And when the ice finally broke uh, in April of 1916, the crew sailed in lifeboats to reach Elephant Island. But they realized rescue was going to be unlikely there. So Shackleton and a small crew embarked on an 800 mile open boat journey to South Georgia Island, where there was a whaling station. After a grueling 16 day journey across the Southern Ocean, they reached South Georgia Island. Shackleton and a few men then trucked across the island's rugged terrain to reach the whaling station. And after several attempts, Shackleton successfully rescued the remaining crew on Elephant Island in August of that year. The Ken Boric Air Antarctica Crash Bob Heath was an experienced Canadian pilot. He worked in the Northwest Territories, uh, piloting scientists to ice flows to study polar bears. And During the fall, he would pilot a twin otter all the way to Antarctica. This would be a four day long trip. There he'd spend the entire winter piloting scientists to various research stations. When spring hit, he'd travel back home, making pit stops on his way to visit a family in Winnipeg and Toronto. In 2013, Heath took off on another flight to Antarctica along with two other crew, and they were set to arrive at Terra Nova Bay Research Station, but they never showed up. And two days went by with no sign of the crew until a search and rescue crew spotted the tail of the plane jutting out from a snow covered mountain in the Queen Alexandra Mountain Range. Uh, the crash was determined to be unsurvivable. What makes the case even more distressing is that the bodies were never recovered, as attempting to do so would be incredibly dangerous. They had just crashed in too precarious a spot. Number 8, Flight 571. On October 13th, 1972, Uruguayan Air Force Flight 571, carrying 45 passengers and crew, including members of the Uruguayan rugby team and their friends and family, crashed into the Andes Mountains in Argentina. 27 of the 45 person crew had actually survived the initial crash, but they had limited food supplies, a little warm clothing, and no way of communicating with the outside world. In order to survive, they resorted to pretty drastic measures. In the days following the crash, the passengers relied on first whatever meager rations they had, but as these supplies just continued to dwindle and hope of rescue began to fade, desperation set in. In order to stay alive, some of these survivors made the difficult decision to resort to they consumed the bodies of the deceased passengers who had died in the crash or succumbed to the harsh weather conditions. And after more than two months in the mountains, two of the passengers finally managed to make contact with three men on horseback, like days out from uh, their initial crash landing site. And uh, these guys ended up going for help. And finally, after 72 days in the wilderness, the remaining 14 survivors were rescued. 
In at number 7 we have the Swedish Antarctic Expedition. The Swedish Antarctic Expedition of 1901-1904 to led by Otto Nordenskjold encountered a crisis when their ship, which was actually called the Antarctic, got stuck in the ice of the Weddell Sea in 1903. They were unable to free the ship, forcing the crew to abandon it. Stranded on the ice, they survived by hunting seals and penguins, melting ice for water, and constructing a basic shelter made out of stone. They waited for rescue for almost a year, and then in November of 1903, the crew managed to launch lifeboats and reached Paulette Island, finding supplies from a previous expedition. They had to camp out for yet another whole winter before finally being rescued in November of 1904 by the Argentine Corvette Uruguay. Uh, so, you know, a happy ending, but a failed expedition. Two winters spent anywhere but indoors, especially in Antarctica. That is a disaster to me. Next on the list is the Mount Erebus disaster. On November 28th, 1979, Air New Zealand Flight 901, a sightseeing flight, crashed into Mount Erebus in Antarctica. The flight was carrying 257 passengers passengers and crew eager to view the Antarctic landscape, and the crash was caused by a navigational error. The flight crew were relying on incorrect coordinates programmed into the aircraft's computer system, believing they were flying over McMurdo Sound, a large body of water, when in reality, they were headed directly towards Mount Erebus. And active volcano. Poor visibility due to overcast conditions and whiteout snow also made it really difficult to visually identify the mountain in time to avoid crashing into it. Upon impact, the aircraft disintegrated, taking the lives of all 257 people on board instantly. The Comandante Ferraz Station Fire On February 25th, 2012, at the Brazilian Antarctic Research Station in Antarctica, a deadly fire broke out. The fire resulted in the loss of two lives. The fire broke out in a machine room at the station, quickly spreading due to the intense winds and the flammable materials inside. 69 people present at the station were evacuated, but tragically, two members of the Brazilian Navy lost their lives during the incident. The fire completely destroyed a significant portion of the research station, laboratories, living quarters, as well as valuable scientific equipment. It's believed that the fire broke out after an explosion caused by a short circuit. Next, we have the disappearance of Carl R. Disch. Carl Robert Disch was an ionospheric physicist working for the National Bureau of Standards. He disappeared near Bird Station, Antarctica on May 8, 1965, and is presumed dead. Disch was stationed at the Radio Noise Building of Bird Station, where he conducted ionospheric studies. On the morning of May 8, he left the radio noise building to return to the main station complex. When he failed to arrive at the main station within a reasonable time, though, a search was launched. They spotted his trail at first, but the search party had to return to the station to refuel. And by the time they returned, his trail had been covered by drifting snow and he was never found. They tried to increase the visibility of the station. They fired off flares. They used extra floodlights, but there was still no sign of him. And what made things even worse was the temperatures had dropped as low as minus 42. The search was eventually called off on May 14th and Dish was declared presumed dead. He was only 26 years old. Number three, the Academic Sholkowski. The Academic Sholkowski, a Russian research vessel, became trapped in Antarctic ice on December 24th of 2013. Merry goddamn Christmas. The ship was carrying a team of scientists, journalists, and tourists who were on expedition to retrace the steps of Australian explorer Douglas Mawson. The situation was caused by a combination of rapidly changing weather conditions and large ice flows. And the ship's crew tried to navigate through the ice, but the surrounding ice pack just closed in around them, trapping the vessel. They tried to break through the ice, which didn't work, so they tried waiting for natural movements in the ice pack to create openings, but no luck there either. And the passengers and crew were stuck for over a week until finally a Chinese icebreaker, the Zhu Long, and Australian icebreaker, the Aurora Australis, were sent to assist. And after several days, the passengers and crew members were airlifted to safety by a helicopter from the Zhu Long, while the remaining crew stayed aboard the ship to sail it back home once the conditions were more favorable. Eventually, a break in the ice did allow for the ship to maneuver and escape on January 7th, reaching open water and uh, 
ending the entire ordeal. The tragic incident involving Jeremy Bailey, David Wilde, John Wilson, and John Ross occurred in 1965 near the Heimfort Mountains in East Antarctica. So this group was traveling on a muskeg tractor and its sledges with a team of dogs running behind them. Three of the men were in the cab of the muskeg and uh, John Ross sat on the sledge at the back close to the Huskies. Bailey was driving, Wilde and Wilson were scanning the ice ahead. At around 8.30, the dogs alongside the sledge suddenly stopped running and the sledge came to an abrupt halt. Ross realized something was off and turned to find that the muskeg had disappeared from view. He ran up to the first sledge to see that it had wedged into the top of a large crevice that ran across their path. The muskeg had fallen about 30 meters or 100 feet into the crevice, with its tracks wedged against one ice wall and the cab flattened against the other. So Ross called out, but there was no response from the men inside the cab down there. After some time, Bailey's voice was actually heard, confirming that Wilde had died, and both Bailey and Wilson were seriously injured. Ross tried descending into the crevice to help, but it was pretty treacherous. Bailey told Ross, like, don't come down here, don't risk it. But Ross started descending anyway. It was clear that Bailey was also severely injured, unable to move. Ross continued his attempts to reach them, but Bailey eventually stopped responding. The last sound Ross heard from the crevice was a scream from Bailey. Finally, we have the Terra Nova Expedition. The Terra Nova Expedition, led by Captain Robert Falcon Scott, was a British Antarctic expedition that took place between 1910 and 1913. The primary objective was to be the first to reach the South Pole. And in January 1911, the expedition established its base, known as Cape Evans on Ross Island in Antarctica. Over the next two years, the team conducted scientific research and made some attempts to reach the South Pole, but on January 17th of 1912, after a long and brutal journey, a five-man party led by Scott finally reached the South Pole, only to be met with a Norwegian flag planted in the ground. Yeah, a Norwegian expedition led by Rald Amundsen had beaten them to the punch just over a month earlier. Uh, there's a photo online of the group just after they'd, they'd reached their destination and uh, made that disappointing discovery. It's pretty rough to look at. Uh, and now, completely disheartened, the team began their long journey back to Cape Evans, but they would never make it back. They faced increasingly harsh conditions on their return journey. By late March of 1912, they were caught in a fierce blizzard, unable to continue their journey, and the men just were just stuck in their tents, basically. They struggled with frostbite, complete exhaustion and starvation. Scott and his two remaining companions, Edward Wilson and Henry Bowers, died in extreme cold and exhaustion in their tent, just 11 miles from a supply depot. Pyramids. So a couple years back, satellite images revealed a mysterious triangular formation in Antarctica's desolate landscape. When the images hit social media, debates and speculations about the origin of this quote-unquote pyramid began. The pyramid shape appeared in satellite images of the Ellsworth Mountain Range, located in the southern reaches of Antarctica. It seemed to have a striking resemblance to the dimensions of Egypt's iconic Great Pyramid of Giza, measuring two kilometers in each direction from its square base. And as these images circulated on social media platforms, the conspiracy theories began to flow. Now, scientists attribute these formations to natural processes and optical illusions, but perhaps there's a deeper secret being hidden from us in the cold, inhospitable terrain of Antarctica. Was there some ancient civilization that used to call the South Pole home? Did a group of beings from somewhere beyond our planet construct it? I don't know, I'm just here to ask the important questions. And now I'm here to tell you that if you are liking our channel so far, if you're new here, why not hit that subscribe button? We have uh, awesome videos coming at you on the daily, plenty to see. Don't miss out. Do that right now. Next up, we have the Anita discovery. The Antarctic Impulsive Transient Antenna, or Anita, is a sophisticated scientific tool in the form of a high-tech balloon operated by NASA, floating above Antarctica. Its mission is to track subatomic particles generated by the interactions of high-energy neutrinos entering Earth's atmosphere from the depths of space. 
But a few years ago, Anita made a strange discovery. It detected neutrinos seemingly originating from beneath the Earth's surface. Quite the departure from its intended uh, function of capturing space-borne neutrinos. One of the more fun hypotheses behind this is that these detected particles may be signs of a possible parallel universe where the fundamental laws of our own universe might operate in complete reverse. Now, this is really just speculative, but it's a pretty fascinating idea. Scientists were pretty perplexed by these findings, and as of right now, there still isn't a definitive explanation. At number eight, we have the Ross Island haunting. Ross Island is not only home to the McMurdo Station, a hub for scientific research, it also harbors something much darker. It's rumored to be haunted. There was a tragic plane crash on the island in 1979, and this crash claimed the lives of 257 people. Over the years, Visitors to Ross Island have reported unsettling occurrences, describing ghostly footsteps echoing in the icy darkness and mysterious voices that seem to emanate from nowhere. Some claim to have come face to face with full-on apparitions, believing to be the restless spirits of the plane crash victims. Wandering the frigid, snow-covered landscape for eternity, the haunting stories surrounding Ross Island have continued be passed down through generations of Antarctic explorers and researchers. Number seven, the UFO crash landing. In 2018, an ex-Navy SEAL who had worked in the South Pole revealed some intriguing information to an investigative journalist named Linda Moulton Howe about an alien structure he once visited. He wished to remain anonymous as this information was highly Classified. In August of 2003, this individual and his team had been tasked with a highly classified objective under the guise of a research reconnaissance mission. They arrived at their destination where they found a large dark structure protruding from the ice. There were doors on it, these big square slabs cut into the structure that when you, you push on, kind of receded into the building opening up into this long hallway. The inside of the structure was lit green by an unknown source and adorning the walls were strange hieroglyphics, but they didn't resemble any hieroglyphics seen here on Earth. Uh, this is a pretty outlandish story, impossible to prove, but hard to discredit uh, completely because it's just hearsay really, but it is fascinating. Plus. Antarctica is one of the most unpopulated places on Earth. It would be a good spot for little green men from space to operate without the uh, presence of prying eyes. So let's stay on the topic of UFOs for a minute and discuss another possible UFO crash landing in Antarctica, this time spotted with satellite images. YouTube channel Secure Team 10 shared a video back in 2018 zooming close in on a small island just off the coast of Antarctica, which seemed to show a long long, sharp mark in the snow, as if something had crashed and then skidded along. Now, this island has the exact same environment as Antarctica. It seems to be a piece of it that broke off and floated away. So it's inhospitable, totally void of people. So what is this object? The narrator describes it as cigar shaped, covered by mounds of snow. Whatever the object is, it's also very large and the trail it left behind is almost a thousand meters long. The trail behind this mysterious object leads to a mountain and there's debris that seems to have been pushed out at the base. It looks like as if the object flew down and crashed into the mountain before skidding along the ice where it now sits. Part of me thinks there could have been an avalanche or something on the mountain and maybe this is just a piece of rock that slid out extra far. I don't know. What do you all think though? At number five, we have Scott's Hut. Back to the haunted realm now. In 1911, 25 men led by Sir Robert Scott departed from this hut in Cape Evans on an expedition to the South Pole. An expedition they would never return from. The hut now stands just as it did all those years ago. There are belongings laying around, scientific equipment, Equipment. Even the frozen penguins the group had been studying remain on the outside of the hut. It's almost completely frozen in time. And as intriguing as it would be to give this place a visit, staff and visitors do claim to have an odd feeling when stepping inside it. There's a sadness about the place, an emptiness, a, a place that was so full of life with uh, daring explorers about to begin an epic journey never to come back. Only maybe they did come back. It's no surprise 
realize that with an eerie history like that, some folks believe the hut to be haunted. Ghostly whispers, shadowy figures, a sense of not being alone. These are just some of the things guests have reported during their visits. Number four, the giant hole. In 2017, researchers in Antarctica observed a massive polenia, a large area of open water within the sea ice, suddenly appearing. It was already massive, but things got even crazier when the polenia expanded at an unprecedented rate, increasing in size by more than eight times within just a few weeks. The discovery was made in Weddell Sea, an area known for its hard freezing conditions. Polenias are not uncommon in Antarctica, but their sudden and substantial growth is a more rare occurrence. That puzzled the researchers. These gaps in the ice are usually maintained by complex processes, ocean currents, temperature variations, but the rapid expansion of this particular one challenged existing scientific understanding. Researchers and climate experts were left with a series of questions. Uh, what was causing this rapid expansion? Was it related to climate Climate change, natural variability, or some other unknown factor, and the scientific community set out to study this event. With the use of satellite imagery, ocean sensors, and computer models, but the prevailing theory is that the polenia was caused by intense cyclones. All right, next let's talk about all the military presence in Antarctica. Why, what's going on there? Let's start by going all the way back to World War II. There have been rumors for decades that Mr. H himself, the dictator of Germany might have established a covert base in Antarctica. As for what they were doing there, there are lots of rumors, uh, but the SS were super into mysticism and the occult, always in pursuit of ancient artifacts that they believed had powers that could aid in their conquest. Pretty wild, but maybe they were after something hidden somewhere in the frozen tundra. After the war in 1946 and 47, the US sent a huge fleet to Antarctica, and many believe that they had been tasked with destroying this sea secret German base. As for more contemporary military activities, who knows what's going on? Just imagine vast hidden research facilities buried beneath the ice or cutting edge technology being uh, tested in the harshest conditions imaginable. Conspiracies suggest everything from advanced weaponry to secretive scientific experiments related to climate change or extraterrestrial phenomena. Who knows? And number two is Deception Island. Deception Island, nestled in the icy expanse of Antarctica, holds a chilling history that goes beyond its freezing temperatures. Once a bustling whaler's station, remnants of this grim past still linger in the form of whale bones strewn across some of its beaches, a reminder of an industry that relentlessly hunted these beautiful creatures. When the Great Depression hit and oil prices plummeted, the whaler's station was abandoned, only to be repurposed later as a British World War II base. Now today, visitors uh, to Whalers Bay, a landing site on this island, have shared tales of their experiences. Some have reported witnessing eerie apparitions, strange orbs of light. Some have even claimed to hear disembodied voices echoing across the ice. In 2009, when the crew of the American uh, TV show Destination Truth ventured to the bay, they captured unexplained bangs and the unsettling sight of a shadowy figure roaming among the decaying ruins. The crew even captured a thermal signature in a window and an SOS signal emanating from one of the abandoned shacks. But finally, we have the theory that Atlantis could have been located deep beneath the ice of Antarctica. According to Plato, Atlantis was this advanced civilization that mysteriously vanished overnight. Now, when we think of Atlantis, we usually picture it in the sunny Mediterranean not you know buried under all that ice down south but here's the twist antarctica wasn't always an icy wasteland millions of years ago it had forests and a much milder climate so some folks propose that atlantis could have existed in antarctica before it froze over or some other ancient civilization they point to satellite images showing uh, peculiar shapes under the ice speculating that these could be remnants of the lost city. We already talked about a pyramid earlier. That could, could have something to do with it. Scientists, though, uh, of course, remain skeptical. They've been studying Antarctica for years, haven't found any concrete evidence to support this idea, but it's fun to think about. Could that pyramid shape, again, possibly 
play into this, who knows. 10, we have Deception Island. In 1906, a Norwegian Chilean whaling company started using Whalers Bay as a base for their factory ship. Other operations followed closely behind them, and then the next thing you know, a boom town was born. But then, by just 1931, after a sweeping decline in the market for whale oil due to the Great Depression, the island was abandoned. Since then, it has quite literally become a ghost town, with visitors reporting seeing strange orbs of light coming from the abandoned huts, seeing apparitions of people walking around, and even hearing disembodied voices. So while the South Pole remains a harsh land with no official permanent population, it seems that ghosts who are unaffected by what makes the South Pole so difficult to endure have settled in and haunt all those who try to enter their domain. Next up at number 9. Wordy Hut. Although it's named after James Wordy, who was the chief scientist for Sir Edmund Shackleton's endurance expedition in 1914, the Wordy Hut was built much later in 1947. For years, it had been rumored to be haunted by terrifying spirits, and after several reports, a group of paranormal researchers from Destination Truth decided to see for themselves and spend a night in the hut. When they arrived, they were immediately taken back by the energy of the cabin. They knew that something was there. That night, members of the team heard frantic flipping of light switches and slamming doors from rooms where no one was staying. Jars began falling off the shelves all on their own, and after their one night stay, they left completely creeped out. Now, I always think a telling tale of if some place is truly scary is when paranormal investigators, people whose job is literally to investigate creepy stuff, get scared and don't want to come back. Well, even so, visitors have checked it out since, but all reported similar events that chilled them to the bone and have never returned. Next up at number 8 the ghost ship of Jenny. Thought to have been abandoned in port in 1823, this ship was thought to be lost forever. That was until a whaling ship made a horrifying discovery a few years later back in 1840. As the legend goes, Jenny had gotten stuck in the ice while on its expedition, and no one knew where it had ended up or what had happened to the crew aboard. That was until the whaling ship discovered them, and believing it to be the legendary Jenny, decided to go on board to check out what might still be on it. When they made their way onto the ship, they were horrified to find all the bodies frozen solid and perfectly preserved by the ice. Allegedly, the crew found a note they believed to be written by the captain that read, May 4th, 1823, no food for 71 days. I am the only one left alive. While some believe it's just folklore, others swear by the tale claiming all the sailors of Jenny haunt the boat to this day. Coming in at number 7, Mountains of Madness. While Antarctica may be one of the most haunted places in the world, it is also home to some breathtaking scenery. But the Mountains of Madness kind of fall into the first category. Officially called the Gambertsev Mountain Range, they are roughly the size of the Alps, but there is one catch. No one has ever seen them. But how could that be, I am sure you are wondering. Well, back in the 1950s, a group of Russian explorers discovered there were strange gravity fluctuations coming from below the ice. After a bit of sleuthing, they discovered the fluctuations to be from an entire subglacial mountain range hidden below three miles of ice. First of all, the fact that there is three mile deep ice is enough of a reason for me to never want to go there, but I digress. Scientists have compared it to studying another planet, which to some might be exciting, but to others they feel it's terrifying. No one knows what kind of life could be under there, what could have been preserved there for the last 250 million years. And some have even said they felt a strange presence when they are near. Coming in at number 6, Shackleton's Hut. Antarctica is mainly a destination visited by scientists and explorers, but considering many of the early explorers died while on these trips, it also makes a lot of sense as to why they are all 
haunted. And one man who claimed to be a non-believer of ghosts would return from his trip thinking much differently. His name was Sir Edmund Hillary and he was a New Zealand mountaineer and explorer who in 1953 along with his Sherpa was the first known person to reach the summit of Mount Everest. So after conquering the mountain he was looking for another adventure and sought out the South Pole five years later. When he arrived he stayed in Sir Ernest Shackleton's abandoned hut from his famous endurance expedition. And when he was there, he claims to have seen Shackleton's ghost walk towards him and welcome him to the hut before vanishing right in front of his eyes. Ever since, it's been known as a paranormal hotspot and many who visit leave terrified by what they see. Next up at number 5, Scott's Hut. During the early 1900s, there was a huge race to be the first country to reach the South Pole. Then in 1911, explore Explorer Robert Falcon Scott and his team set out on a mission against Norway, later called the Terra Nova Expedition, to do just that. While many explorers, Scott included, had explored Antarctica, none had managed to reach the pole. And so the race was on. A hut was pre-constructed in Britain that was brought over as a base camp for the crew and they set up near the Great Ice Barrier. Eventually it was decided some of the men would stay behind with supplies and shelter and the rest of the team would venture out further. But sadly, their mission was ultimately a bust as by the time they reached the pole, the Norwegian flag had already been planted. So the men turned around to head back, but sadly due to frostbite, starvation and disease, the men died off one by one and never made their return. Those that have visited the hut today claim to hear strange voices and footsteps all around the cabin. Apparently the minute you walk in, you feel as though you're being watched watched, and some even swear they've seen the ghosts of Scott and his men lurk inside. Next up at number 4, Ross Island. Home to one of the most recognized research stations across the continent, it's also the site of a devastating plane crash that left the island drowning in lost spirits. Back in 1977, New Zealand began operating sightseeing trips via plane over Antarctica, but in 1979, a true disaster would strike. Though exactly what happened is unknown, somehow the computer directing the flight got rerouted and instead of taking its usual trip, it ended up flying dangerously close to a nearby mountain. All of a sudden, in the blink of an eye, the plane crashed, instantly killing all 257 passengers and crew members on board. Today those that visit the island claim to hear unsettling voices in the darkness as well as strange ghostly footsteps. Some say they have even seen what they believe to be the flight victims wandering around the frigid landscape, eerily moaning and crying at night. So while there may be some beautiful places to visit, you might want to steer clear of this haunted island altogether. Coming in at number 3, a Soviet military base. Back in 2009, scientists passing through the icy scape came across a strange and concerning discovery. While exploring what's called the Pole of Inaccessibility, which is the point furthest from the sea in Antarctica, the group found a random monument with a bust of Vladimir Lenin perched on top. Now, if you don't know who that is or why that's a little bit creepy, let me explain. Vladimir Lenin was the founder of the Soviet Union and first head of government under the new regime. It was under his ruling that Russia became a one-party communist state. So upon discovering his lone bust in the middle of nowhere, the scientists decided it might be a good idea to keep exploring. After some digging, they happened upon an old Soviet military base that was covered by mountains of snow, and they realized that the bust was facing the direction of Moscow. Now, no one knows how long the bust has been there, and even creepier, no one knows why it's there. But many suspect that it might be the place where Lenin was buried back in 1924, and it's thought that his ghost may still haunt the area to this day. Coming in at number 2. Mount Erebus. Mount Erebus is the southernmost volcano on 
Earth, and it's still very much active. Some like to refer to it as the place where fire meets ice, as well inside the mountain it's swirling with molten hot magma, the outside remains frozen solid and is surrounded by ice caves. And while that might sound super cool, it is also the site of the infamous Ross Island plane crash that I already spoke about, and so it's littered with ghosts seeking revenge for having their lives taken too soon. And while many of the spirits are known to roam around the entire island, frightening visitors at every chance, some of the spirits are stuck in the place that took their lives. Some say that if you walk past the mountain, you can still hear the screams of the victims who lost their lives to the crash. And last up in our number one spot, we have the Drake Passage. The Drake Passage may just be the most well known part of all of Antarctica, but probably not for a good reason. Widely considered the most powerful convergence of seas, the Drake Passage is the point where the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean converge with the southern seas, and it is notorious for its treacherous waters. It's a great feat for anyone to even dare to cross it, and it's estimated over the years that more than a thousand people have died attempting to pass through its terrifying and turbulent waves. Many believe that all who have lost their lives to the passage remain, haunting the waters to warn those that attempt the feat to turn back. Or maybe they're trying to bring you into their realm with them. Either way, it's best to stay far, far, far away because even if the ghosts don't get you, the waves almost certainly will. Sea pigs. This list gets creepy and or crawly, but first we gotta ease into the Arctic Ocean. We gotta start off this haunting list with the sea pig. Look at this little guy, okay, the pug of the ocean. He looks like a stress ball with feelings. What's going on with him? They look like something that would be microscopic, but really they're six inches long, wide, round, big, I don't know, they're pretty large. They stick together, and I mean that in a literal sense. Sea pigs will travel in large gatherings. They live in the deepest, darkest depths of the ocean, so they're hard to find, really. Their mating routine is also still a mystery. We have no idea how they do it. And just by looking at them, we're like, no guesses, certainly no guesses for me. All we know is that they travel in groups, so I don't know. Sounds like it's a good time, at least. Lifespan and mating life, total mystery. All we know is that they eat decaying matter on the ocean floor. Kudos to the crew over at Ambari. The footage they find of these deep sea creatures is always fascinating. It's always so otherworldly over at Ambari. Are you guys hiring? I'm afraid of the ocean, but you know, I'll do some behind the scenes stuff, who knows. I'll just edit the weird fish. I'll put the text in. Like, what the f is this? Ooh. Number nine, rock bottom. A little over a year ago, scientists camped out in the middle of the Filchner Ron ice shelf for nearly three months. Why? All in the name of science. Yeah, we're getting cold. Geologist James Smith from the British Antarctic Survey slept in a tent. Who does this? Why do you choose to do this? James Smith, apparently. Here we go. He flew five hours out to this ice shelf. Him and his team had to melt 20 tons of snow in order to pour hot water through this ice shelf for 30 hours straight. When the team lowered their gear down through this 3,000 feet of ice, they couldn't get a sample of sediment from the ocean floor because they hit a boulder. I mean, the odds here alone, I mean, the entire seafloor is basically flat and they end up hitting this thing. At first they were frustrated, but this boulder that is 160 miles away from daylight is home to microbial malts, these alien-like sponges. These cylindrical sponges, possibly hydroids. I love seeing scientists get jazzed about stuff. They're like, oh, this rock had absolutely no business being here. Like, guy, you just melted through ice for 20 hours in the middle of Antarctica. I, I feel like it's the other way around. Imagine if those sea sponges could talk. They're like, oh, of all the spots, really? Please close that. The first shred of light, and it's just a big GoPro coming at them. They're like, what is that? Number eight, emperor penguins. They're as glorious as their name hints towards. I remember watching Happy Feet a lot growing up. I was really into penguins and tap dancing for a hot minute there. That movie changed the game. The main penguins here, they're all emperor penguins. Robin Williams' character, Lovelace, he's a rock hopper penguin with the cool, you know, the fluffy eyebrows. The other guys are all emperor penguins. The colorful orange necks, the OG characters, they're all beautiful. They're the largest penguins on the planet and their breeding habits set them aside from the rest. Once the female lays an egg, I'm not gonna do sound effects for this whole process. I don't know why I did that. That's <laughs> so stupid. Once the female lays an egg, she'll leave it with her mate for an incubation period, but she'll walk over 50 miles to the ocean just to get food. The mate has to fast for around 100 days just waiting for his next meal. Once in the water, these emperor penguins really go for it. They soar. They can dive up to 2,000 feet, which is far deeper than any bird in the animal kingdom. And they can hold their breath for around 20 minutes, which is incredible. Longest I've gotten is three minutes, but I'm coming for you, Mumbles. Number seven, chin strap 
penguins. Okay, from happy feet to slappy feet. Chinstrap penguins are the most aggressive of the penguin family. They're crazy, these guys are nuts. They're tiny, they have to be aggressive. I mean, look at them. They only grow up to 30 inches in length. They're so tiny, but again, they're so aggressive. They only grow up to 30 inches in length, so they have to be, you know? These ones don't tap dance, they actually crump battle you. Yeah, they embarrass you in front of you and your kin. Chin straps are small and quick because their diet requires them to be. With krill wading 50 miles offshore, chin strap penguins have quite the commute. Their thick skin is also quite literal. Their blubber keeps them warm during these long commutes. As long as no leopard seals show up, their commute is pretty smooth sailing. Number six, the sea spider. Okay, we had a few ha-has with the penguins. Now it's time to get weird. Now we know why we're here. The sea spider, thankfully, is not an actual spider. It just looks like one, kind of like daddy long legs. This is a daddy cold legs. It's a marine anthropod, and the reason it's so haunting to look at is because of polar gigantism. Many species have this. Their climate being so harsh, lack of nutrients, lack of sunlight, friends, family, etc. Scientists believe it's because sea spiders have slowed down their metabolism, so much so they require a small amount of oxygen to survive. So over over time, the oxygen around these sea spiders turn them into like Captain America. They just juice them up. They take on way more than they're adapted to. And in turn, we get giant terrifying sea bugs. Nice. Number five, scale worms. Upon first glance, again, scale worms look microscopic. They look like tiny bacteria that are covered in scales. Hairy, weird, gross scales. They're pretty horrifying to look at. These guys are actually eight inches long on average, so they're not tiny at all. This is what they really look like. The Antarctic scale worm is covered with elytra, these natural bristles. But the most distracting feature here has to be its mouth, head, mouth thing, yeah. This part on its mouth can literally fully retract. It can go inside out, yeah. It can suck its own mouth inside of its body, and then when it's time to eat, it pops out and then claws its prey to pieces. Horrible. I saw a video of it, I almost threw up. We went from happy feet to retractable mandibles. Cheers, that's how we do it here on MA. Number four, glass sponges. Antarctic glass sponges. They don't get their name because they're translucent, they get their name because their skeletons contains silica, which is a literal component of glass. How neat is that? Back in 2013, a massive discovery took place. Scientists figured out how these glass sponges grow in size. Well, they figured out that they do grow in general. As our ice shelves slowly disappear, the numbers of glass sponge sightings they increase. They don't hunt down prey at all, obviously. They spend their entire life quite still, just eating the leftovers that happen to drift along their merry way. Their food was so sparse as well, for a long time it was fully believed they couldn't possibly grow. Because what would they possibly eat? The more we learn about glass sponges, the better, because these little guys tell us a lot about climate change. We're like, how is it happening? What's going on? Nothing's happening. We're, they don't talk much. They're really quiet. They don't have mouths or eyes. Number three, the springtail. Also known as the elephants of Antarctica, springtails are hexapods. They're exclusively land animals. Whereas penguins, they sometimes, you know, bop and swim. These guys are only on land. They're tiny as well. They measure up to about a millimeter on average. They look like earwigs almost. Ice earwigs that eat bacteria. Horrible. They got a big old butt too, so you're probably gonna notice if you see one walking by. They live on average one to two years, and they produce glycerol, which helps them, you know, not freeze to death. That always helps. Antarctic springtails live longer than springtails in other parts of the world because the frigid temperatures, again, slows their metabolism down so much they can just survive off basically nothing. They're not immortal, but as far as ice insects go, they're, they're close. They're pretty mighty. Small but mighty. Number two, the hoff crab. When these creatures get their names, it's often in relation to their appearance or their super ability. The immortal jellyfish ages in reverse. The glass octopus is otherwise see-through. The hoff crab gets its name because it looks hairy, like David Hasselhoff. He's hairy as well. Yeah, David Hasselhoff just tweeted the hoff crab with this photo. So random, imagine following him and you see this, you're like, what's going on, why? We love it. The scientific name later given was Kiwa Tyleri, appropriately named after its discoverer, Paul Tyler, from Southampton University. Found in the East Scotia Ridge on the Southern Ocean, where the water is too cold for the hoff crab, these guys are just covered in bacteria, hence their hairy hoff look. Because it spends so much time staying warm near hydrothermal vents on the ocean floor. The guy literally just sits around a deep sea campfire just collecting ice cold bacteria. What a, what a wild life. He's a deep sea hairy caveman, essentially. When it comes time to eat, the hoff crab just scrapes off a little bit of bacteria from any part and then just gives himself more food. He gives himself a little haircut salad. We love those. And finally coming in number one, the colossal squid. Not to be confused with the giant squid, those are similar but smaller. Still terrifying but 
more petite. As its name gives away, the colossal squid is much larger. They live in the darkest, coldest depths surrounding the waters of Antarctica, and these squids, on average, they're around 46 feet in length, with the females being the largest of the species. The biggest and baddest, of course. They have large tentacles with suckers equipped with razor hooks, so whatever it does grab, it's certainly not letting go anytime soon. Its diet consists of large fish, and when I say large, I'm referring to, you know, seven foot long Patagonian toothfish, not a goldfish. They're colossal, and they try and fight whales sometimes. They're crazy. They have no regard for the size of others. They're gonna fight anything and everyone. They're more often than not marked up, suggesting they've been in a few deep sea tussles. On top of being magnificent, they're quite mysterious. Only two specimens have ever been collected, with the second being recent in 2014. Some believe this is the closest living relative to the Kraken. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Sound off below. Either way, I'm gonna go throw up. I never want to see any of these in real life. Awesome. Axis Powers Base. In the late 1930s, the fascist party from World War II stirred out quite a bit of intrigue with their Arctic escapades. But what was really going on? Well, it all started with a German expedition from December 1938 to April 1939 on the ship MS Schwabenland. Their mission was to claim a slice of Antarctica known today as Drawning Mod Land. That's gonna come up uh, multiple times throughout this video, so remember that. On paper, their main motivation of this expedition was to protect the German whaling industry or so they claimed. The Schwabenland was packing some cool gear like a steam catapult and two Dornier wall flying boats. These babies were used to snap pics of a whopping 600,000 square kilometers of the frozen landscape. They dropped a bunch of aluminum flags from the plane and left some on foot expeditions, but none of these flags have ever been seen again. The Germans swooped in and officially claimed the surveyed land as new Schwabenland in August of 1939, but then World War II came along and spoiled their base building plans, or so so they claim. The German claim to this slice of Antarctica was dropped in 1945, and there's no hard evidence of them doing much else in Antarctica during World War II at this time. Or so they claimed. At number 9 is the British Operation Tarabin. Tarabin? I don't know. Antarctica might seem like the last place you would expect to see wartime secrets, but during World War II, Britain had some hidden plans on ice. While the Germans weren't chilling out there, allegedly, Britain was in fact making moves in Antarctica. They staked their claim in Antarctica to fend off Argentina and Chile's claims, both of whom were buddy-buddy with Germany. In 1944, Operation Terebin kicked off, where the British occupied their slice of the Antarctic pie. They said it was about hunting down German ships, but it was more than that. They set up a secret base in frozen desolation, and these bases weren't bustling metropolises either. They were small manned outposts, but they weren't just sipping on hot cocoa out there. They gathered important intel and conducted science scientific research. After the war, the chill research vibe continued, evolving into the British Antarctic Survey. Now with both the Allies and the Axis powers holding a stake in the Antarctic land, it was only a matter of time before this Cold War got freezer burn. But before I get into this secret Antarctic battle, if you're enjoying this video so far, you could support the channel by pressing like, subscribing to Most Amazing, and ringing that notification bell. At number 8 is Modenheim 1. It's often rumored that during Operation Tabarin, the Brits set up a base, Modenheim 1 in Drawning Mod Land during the World War II to keep an eye on the supposed Axis base. But conveniently, there are no public records to prove of Modenheim 1's existence. Now, the fascists allegedly attacked Modenheim 1 in July of 1945, followed by SAS led retaliatory missions from October to December of the same year. But for as fantastic as this Antarctic covert op story is, there's not a lot to back it up. You see, on paper, Operation Terebin wasn't about secret war. It aimed at a British scientific presence in the British claimed sector of Antarctica. Plus, there's no indication of SAS presence in Antarctica during the war. So the tales of the hidden battle and mystery bases are mostly just myths, my friends. Antarctica was more about scientific exploration than covert ops during those times. Or so they claim. At number 7 is Operation High Jump in 1946-47, to which saw the USA sending the largest crew ever to Antarctica, over 4,700. 700 men, 13 ships, and 33 aircraft. Now, the official purpose was, in fact, a military one, all about preparing for cold weather warfare. But there are rumors that suggest that there was something more covert at play. The conspiracy theorists claim that Operation High Jump's real mission was to destroy the affirmation secret Axis powers in Drawning Mudland. The truth is, High Jump was primarily a military exercise, not a cloak and dagger mission. It was well documented in the press, as the expedition was accompanied by journalists, 
journalists, and official reports were released. While it might have been classified as confidential, it was never really a secret. No flying saucers chased them away, it was just the unpredictability of harsh Antarctic conditions that ended their mission early. Or so they claim. At number 6, Operation Argus Nuclear so there were a lot of talk about these supposed secret bases in Antarctica, but let's delve into some facts here. You see, back in 1958, the US conducted three nuclear explosions during Operation Argus over the South Atlantic, not directly over Antarctica. These were high altitude tests aimed at potentially disrupting radar, radio, and electronics of satellites and missiles during the Cold War. Now, the whole idea that these bases were meant to destroy the fascist basins in Droning Mad Land is just a narrative not supported by evidence. In fact, if these nukes had gone off near Antarctica, the radioactive fallout would have shown up in ice from across the region, but no such peaks of radioisotopes have ever been found in those ice cores. Or so they claim. Moreover, 1958 was the International Geophysical Year, with international corporation and scientists from various countries in the region, making it highly unlikely that such nuclear tests would have gone unnoticed. At number 5, the Mustache Man flees to Antarctica. We all know which one. We all heard theories about how Germany's fascist leader secretly escaped his fate and lives on to this very day, but the details behind the story are shrouded in mystery. But there's one proposed method of escape with some circumstantial evidence to back it up. The tale involving U-boats, Argentina, and the frozen expanse of Antarctica. The U-530 and the U-977, two German U-boats, arrived in Argentina after World War II, sparking rumors of a clandestine escape mission. One of these Argentinian exiles claimed that these U-boats claimed that these U-boats ferried high-ranking fascists, including the mustached man himself, to Patagonia or Antarctica. He even went as far as to suggest the existence of an Axis base in Antarctica called New Berchtesgaden. The problem is that no one had mentioned this base before, or the alleged convoy, before this individual's claims. Interrogation reports reveal that the U-530 was near New York when Germany surrendered, and the U-977 was off the coast of Norway. Their journeys to Argentina, although slow and cautious, aligned with the time required for their separate voyages. Moreover, the idea that these U-boats travel to Antarctica in the dead of winter just defies logic. Winter storms, thick ice, and extreme temperatures make such a voyage nearly impossible. No evidence supports the existence of an Antarctic fascist base or a secret convoy. Or at least, that's what they want you to believe. At number four, the interplanetary corporate conglomerate. According to whistleblower Corey Goode, or Goad, I don't know. There's a buried ancient alien civilization beneath two miles of ice, and it's been hidden from us for decades. This isn't some sci-fi fantasy, it's based on Goad's first-hand experience as a whistleblower from a secret space program. Allegedly. The story goes back to the 1939 Arctic German expedition. The ancient beings he refers to, called the Pre-Adamites, were giants with elongated skulls, and their technology and remnants have allegedly been removed from the site, but only a select few knows what else was discovered. The timing of this revelation is quite interesting, as it might serve as a distraction from explosive global events, including allegations of trafficking among the elite. I don't know how that ties in, but okay. At number three on the list is Admiral Byrd's Crystal City. The esteemed US Naval officer and explorer Admiral Richard Byrd was one of the first pilots to fly over both poles, who actually organized Operation High Jump himself, which as I said, was the largest expedition to ever travel to Antarctica, with all kinds of ships, aircraft, and crew, in order to scout out locations for potential military bases. But during his explorations, Admiral Byrd allegedly came upon something highly unexpected. The following comes from not a public account, but from his own diary, which was discovered by his son after Bird's passing, in which he recounts an extraordinary story. Upon encountering a large cave in the South Pole through which he could easily fly his plane, Bird steers his plane into an opening and flew under the earth. And as he flew within the massive cave, he, he encroaches upon an incredibly temperate and lush environment, not something you would expect in the South Pole. But that's just the beginning. He tells of how he sees a shimmering rainbow city made of crystal, and suddenly, he loses autonomy of his plane as flying disc-shaped objects lead his plane to the ground, whereupon he's escorted to a being which he refers to as the Master in his diary, who tells Burr that this alien species is massively disappointed with nuclear weapons and how they've recently destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki, seeming to be really concerned with what's going on at the surface, telling Bird that he hopes humanity will ultimately stop the use of atomic weapons. At number two, 
is the Antarctic Pyramids. In 2016, rumors of a pyramid-like mountain circulated the internet, capturing the imaginations of many. Could it be the creation of an ancient civilization, or perhaps, through the dramatic pause, evidence of extraterrestrial intervention? Whoa. The square-based pyramid is perched in the Ellsworth Range, standing around 4,000 feet tall. It's like 10 times the size of the pyramids of Giza. And that's just the tip of the iceberg, or should I say the tip of the mountain? Reports of plant and bacterial life dating back eons have also come to light, suggesting that maybe, just maybe, prehistoric, or should I say pre-human society once graced this frigid expanse, crafting not only pyramids, but also tending to vegetation. Bam! Proof of ancient aliens, or just a neat geological formation. I'll let you guys decide in the comments. At number one is the alien base. If this last story is to be believed, there is allegedly a secret alien base with advanced and unconventional weapons hidden in the icy waters of the Antarctic. According to a video uploaded by UFO hunters, a mysterious anomaly about 180 kilometers off the coast of Antarctica has been spotted. They speculate that it's not just some kind of hangar for a spaceship, but that actual aliens might be residing there too. Now this may veer a little bit more towards the conspiracy side rather than the good old urban legend, but hey, it's all good fun. Some believers are advocating for an exploration to confirm the existence of these aliens, while others voice their concerns about potentially sparking an intergalactic war if we're not too careful. So whatever it is, let's just hope we tread carefully at this time. If you enjoyed this Antarctica video, then you have to check out this video next. It's about cybersecurity threats that will end the world. Click the video now to find out more before it's too late.